Hello everyone and welcome. This is uh, a class on computability and complexity, CSC 200 at UCSD in the computer science department. My name is Mihir, Mihir Bellare. And in this lecture, I'm just going to try to give you some sort of broad idea of what this subject and class are about. Computers surround us nowadays. They permeate our lives in ways that we uh, don't necessarily acknowledge on a daily basis. From our cell phones and laptops that we certainly use all the time, but then there's Alexa and there's the earbuds with which you listen to music. Your car has a computer. Already from a young age, we get almost addicted to them. It's hard to live without them. And yet sometimes they're frustrating. It's hard to live with them. Um, regardless, though, what happens is that computing, computing devices are intertwined with our lives and our functioning in a way that it seems hard to disentangle the two. This has many ramifications. Some of them are social. We could discuss that at length, and it's certainly an interesting and important discussion about how these devices impact human interaction, what they do to our attention spans, how they manipulate our worldviews, impact our knowledge and well-being. All that isn't particularly the subject of this course, although I would encourage you to put your cell phones away while watching these videos. What we will go back to here is a consequence of the pervasive presence of computing in our lives is that we take computers themselves for granted. And we have kind of forgotten what a surprising concept computing is. Computing was something that had to be conceived. And the uh, before one even considers the science and engineering that leads to the creation of a modern day computer, one has to consider that merely the concept um, philosophically had to come into being. And that this was something hard to imagine and conceive of. So in this class, we kind of um, step back to think about all this and maybe try to better appreciate computing as a concept. We want to try to understand things like what is a computer at its most, most basic level? What can it do and not do? And um, through that, we also perhaps try to regain some of the historical sense of mystery that must have been felt by the early pioneers of these devices. People who conceived the idea that machines could compute. People like Babbage and Lovelace who designed one early computer and Turing who designed the uh, Turing machine, and there were many other such people. As part of this, we'll ask some very basic questions. For example, what problems can computers solve? And um, once we have some understanding of that, we will classify problems into ones that are solvable and not solvable. Once we have understood that, we'll take a further look inside the class of solvable problems and start discussing how efficiently we can solve them. Now, if a human says, I have a problem, maybe it's that they're stressed by their boss, annoyed at having to wait in a grocery store, something like that. That's not what we mean by a problem here. A problem here aims to capture a task that a computer can perform. And so we will have to define what we mean by problems. And that um, process of having to define the things we're talking about here uh, continues. We will have to say what we mean by a computer in some precise way so that we can ask what it means for a computer to actually solve a problem. Furthermore, we will see many different notions of solvability and we'll have to define in some way what we mean by efficiency. Now, in order to both pose and give precise answers to questions like this, 
our mechanism and language will be mathematics. So we will give a mathematical treatment which has definitions of all these objects. What is a problem? What is a computer? What does solve mean? What does efficient mean? And it's through these mathematical models and results that we will come to the kind of understanding of computing that we are looking for here. So let's illustrate that a little bit by starting with an example of a problem. The type of problem we'll look at here is very simple. It's something where you're given an input and there's a question asked about it. And your task is just to give a yes or no answer to the question. So the problem will have a name. For example, here the problem is called reachability. Your input is a graph. It has a set of nodes, which are the numbers 1 through n. So square brackets n is just that set. And of course, it has some set of edges. And the question you're asked is that in this graph, is there a path from 1 through n? Is there a can you walk along edges of the graph starting at node 1 and eventually you end up at node n? Well, if you're given a particular graph, say this one, it has three nodes and edges as shown. It's an undirected graph, so the edges don't have direction. That's what we mean by a graph. It's quite easy to answer this question. So you can easily see that there is a way to go from 1 through 3. How do you do that? You go from 1 to 2. Then you have to come back to 1 and then you can go from 1 to 3. Now the formal answer to this question is just the yes. It's not like you would give that path. It's not called for. But of course in our reasoning we have that because that's how we think about it. Here's another problem that seems quite similar. It's called Hamiltonian path. The input is the same. So we could ask this question about exactly the same example graph we see above. There's a slight variation in the question which is a restriction on the path. You still want to go from node 1 to node n, but now you're not allowed to visit a vertex more than once. You have to visit each vertex exactly once, and you're asked if you can do this. Okay, again, on a small graph like this, not too hard to look at it. And actually, it turns out, as you can see probably quite easily, that the answer is no. Because if you have to start at 1, what are you going to do? If you go to 2, well, you're not allowed to go back to 1 because you can't revisit 1, and now there's no way to get to 3. And correspondingly, you started at 3. Okay, so yes and no questions are one way at least to formulate something that we can call problems, and we can ask questions about whether you can design computers to answer such questions. Now already, whenever we pursue this process of mathematical abstraction and simplification of computing, we would be hit with or have to consider the relation of our abstractions to kind of the real world of computing or usage. So my kids, for example, if they think about what a computer is to them, their computer is their phone, it's Snapchat, Instagram, Netflix, everything they do. And many people indeed don't really have a distinction between their laptop and all the different things they do on it through the internet. Even if uh, someone has such a distinction, they understand what a browser does, they may be hard put to think of a browser as something that just answers a decision problem like we consider something where here's an input, tell me a yes or no answer. So why is it that we look at these decision problems? Because somehow, in the end, if you kind of break down and take apart what your computer does, you take away the part that the internet does, look at just what's happening on your machine, and take complex sequences of tasks and instructions on a program and look at some core, you will find that there are little decision problems at the basis of it. And in some sense, we put those together to arrive at whatever high-level object we want. Now, this is, it takes some work to see something like that. And obviously, the decision problems vary. They're not necessarily about graphs. They're all kinds of different ones. But at least it gives us a sense that it's okay to look at decision problems. At some level, they're general enough to capture everything. And they're certainly uh, very basic. 
If we now have some understanding of what problems are, we can start asking, what is a computer? So we will adopt a formalization, a mathematical formalization of a computer as something we call a Turing machine. This object has a memory that's a tape, a single tape on which you can write. It's potentially infinite. And the hardware is a head that moves across back and forth over the tape. And there'll be some control that we can program that will move the head and read or write and come to some decision about some input placed on the tape. So it's a very rudimentary device. Its value to us is that it's extremely simple and it can be mathematically specified in a very precise and formal way. And so it becomes easier to reason about it than about the complex objects that are programs in higher level real world languages. However, it's of course also due to its being so simple, rather hard to program. If you need to write code even for a relatively simple function, it will take you quite a lot of time and effort. So um, what is this thing capable of? If you compare this, let's say, to a, to a Python program, you might think at first that the Python program is more powerful, it has more instructions, can do more things. It turns out that isn't really the case. Whatever you can do in Python, you can do with a suitable uh, Turing machine. You can program it to render this Python in some way. And effectively, the two are equally powerful. And this extends to say that a Turing machine is effectively as powerful as any modern day computer. This is something called Church's thesis, and we'll spend some time to justify this to ourselves. Now, beware that this equivalence in power is purely in principle. The Turing machine and Python can perform the same tasks and solve the same problems, but certainly not at the same speeds. The Python will be much faster. Once we have some notion of a computer and we formalized it, we can formalize different types of notions of solvability. The most basic of those we often call decidability. It says that a program uh, M, because we often use M for Turing machines, solves the problem if it kind of does the obvious thing. If you give it some input, it will trundle along, it will eventually halt, and it'll give you back the correct answer, yes or no, to the question that the problem asked about the input. It's important that this be true for all uh, possible inputs. Okay, so we now have some sense of what are problems and maybe some sense of what are computers or programs. Uh, we can start examining different problems and seeing what we can say about their solvability. Now, one of the interesting elements of the theory of computation is that a lot of our questions will pertain to programs themselves. So the problem itself involves a program. For example, you're given as input a program, call it M, and a string X on which you might potentially run M. And you're asked, if I ran M on X, does it halt or does it not halt? Think of this as something you would like a nice compiler to tell you, if I wrote a piece of code before I run it, maybe it would be useful for me to know if, I, if it halts on some input or not, because I don't want to sit there forever waiting for an answer. Why can't my compiler just tell me that? So with that type of motivation, we formulate this and call it the halting problem. Now, one of the more interesting results in what we will study is that um, there is no program that solves the halting problem. This is our first step into what's called computability. Computability is the set of questions where you look at problems and you simply ask, is it possible or not possible to design a program formalized as a Turing machine that correctly solves this problem? On In all instances, it gives the right answer. And the statement here is that for the halting problem, the answer is no. No matter how hard you try, you simply cannot write a compiler or program that solves this. We can then turn to the problems we saw earlier. These are much simpler basic ones. 
it's quite easy here to see that the answer to the computability question is yes. Um, I can easily write a program that takes input a graph and tells me there's a path from 1 through n. In fact, we do this routinely in an algorithms class, and you might use uh, depth for a search or breadth for a search or whatever you like. If I consider the other problem we had as an example, Hamiltonian path, the restriction that the path should only visit each vertex once doesn't make it impossible to write a program to answer this question. Of course, we have more constraints, but you can still explore the graph and you can determine whether or not such a path exists. Now, once we see a number of questions like this where the computability answer is yes, and furthermore, they're kind of interesting in that they're quite closely related as questions, one a slight variant of the other, we might ask about how fast the algorithms that we know exist are to solve these problems. And that's a domain called complexity theory. It asks how efficiently can you solve the problem. Now, obviously, if you can't solve a problem at all, you can't solve it efficiently. So for halting, the answer is there's no efficient program. If you remember your algorithms class, depth for search takes linear time, and you can use that to solve reachability. And we'd consider that a fast algorithm, so there's an efficient solution. And now, more interestingly, this slight variant, the Hamiltonian path problem, which puts a slight restriction on the path, seems to make things quite a bit harder, not in terms of in principle solving the problem, but in terms of how fast you can do it. We don't have a fast algorithm for this problem. Now, a caveat to that is that unlike where for halting, I can prove that there's no program, I can't prove that there's no fast algorithm for Hamiltonian path. It's just that we kind of think there isn't. And so now, broadly speaking, this is the kind of domain that the class is going to explore. It's going to define these notions, look at different problems, and as part of that, also expand on what we mean by solvability to go beyond simply writing programs that give you yes or no answers to the problem, but try to do other things, for example, verify claimed solutions rather than find them from scratch, relax solvability to only be true with high probability, and so on. Okay, so um, at this point, you kind of know what the class is about, and you might be asking yourself now, do I want to be here? Why would anyone look at stuff like this, and how does it help me? Well, that's, of course, a complex question. We all have our lives, as we should, and um, you have your goals, and perhaps your goals are that you came here to learn AI and machine learning and get a job at one of the big companies, and that's great. That's all well and fine. But let me gently suggest that this class isn't particularly going to help you towards those particular goals. What we learn here isn't things you need in some essential way to either perform or obtain these kinds of positions. What this class really is, is just something that's interesting for those who are curious. If you're curious about computing, you feel you want to understand what computers can do and not do, and you're kind of willing to explore things for their own sake, without worrying too much how it's going to help you on the job market, then you're likely to find this class more interesting. Now, that being said, um, there are people, including professors, who will disagree with my claim, and they'll say that there are some topics in this class, like NP-completeness, which we will study, which are actually important to know on the job. And of course, they're right, to some extent, but I'm still not sure that that is enough to warrant sitting through the class if you really don't have the curiosity and mathematical interest in things for their own sake. Okay, that was one warning, and I'll add a second one, which is that the class is mathematical. Now, for some of you, that's um, a concern. For others, it's, um, it's a joy. Uh, many of us enjoy mathematics, 
and um, this class will use that because we need to formulate all our questions precisely. So we will, it will involve abstract reasoning, formal definitions. You will need to understand, come up with and write clear proofs. And this is something that some people are suited for and others don't like that much. You can decide what it is for you. Now, um, having said that, it may seem a little blunt and dismissive, and you may say, what sort of professor is this? Trying, is he trying to scare us away or something? So let me step back and look at it maybe a little differently to see what it is that you might find worthwhile in a class like this. And when one asks a question like that, there is sort of the broader sense and my sense of education, especially when one asks about the value of something we studied many years down the line, is that it may not lie in the actual material so much as in something that surrounds it, broader ideas, questions, perspective, ways of thinking. As an analogy, if you think of the material as data, often the value is in kind of the metadata. And with that kind of perspective and light in mind, I will try whenever possible to highlight these types of things. And I'll show you a few of them here. These are kind of things which I think are worthwhile in this area and a reason to study this subject. So one we kind of already touched on, um, we looked at this halting problem you are given a program and an input and you're asked, does this program halt on the input? It seems like a natural question, obviously very basic and fundamental. And it would be nice to be able to solve this. And we're going to say that you can't solve it. There's no solvability in terms of writing a program that on all inputs MX gives you the right answer. And I would suggest that this is beyond fundamental and basic kind of intriguing. Why is this true? Furthermore, how can we actually prove such a thing is true? The claim that no program solves a problem is not easy to validate because there are infinitely more many programs out there. How can I be so sure that none of them works? So we'll see how you do that. Here's a second highlight. Um, it's something called reduction-based thinking. Okay, so let me introduce that by recalling that we were studying problems formalized as decision problems, where you're given some X and you want to know, answer some yes or no question about X. We, when we start formalizing them, we will cast this decision problem as a set identifying it with the set of positive instances. That means all the inputs on which the answer to the question is yes. For example, for the halting problem, the set halt is all pairs m comma x such that program m halts on x. In this formulation, the question then just becomes given x, does x belong to the set p? Why am I doing this? Because it'll help kind of formulate um, what I want to say about reductions, and in any case, it's how we're going to do things later. So now you're handed a problem. We call it problem A. It's a set, and you're handed an input little a, and you're asked, is does a little a belong to the set A? And you're asked this from the point of view of computing. Can you write a program that for all inputs gives you the right answer? So you want you're puzzling about this. I want to solve this problem. Maybe you're not getting too far. Now it turns out that there's someone else out there and there's also another problem, problem B, where there's some input and you're asked the question is uh, that input in this set B. And there's some smart person who says, I know how to solve this problem. And now our first person, the confused one says, hmm, why don't I get you to help me? The way I do that is by reduction. What that means is I turn problem A into problem B. A reduction is an object which takes as input the instance that person, the first person wants to solve. 
little a, it wants to know whether it's in the set a or not. The reduction itself a program will output another instance, call it little b. But it's not just arbitrary. These two instances are related in a nice way, which is that the first belongs to the set a if and only if the second belongs to the set b. In other words, answers are preserved if the answer to little a being in a is yes, that would be true also for b and vice versa. This um, answer preservation means that our person can now go to this smart person and say, here's b, you know how to solve problem b, tell me what the answer is. So a person says, sure, here's the yes or no answer. And now I'm done because given the property of a reduction that a is in A if and only if B is in B, this yes or no answer is the correct one to my question. Now, once we understand the context of a reduction in this form about this person and the other smart person, we don't really need it. The core of the reduction is the mapping of the instance of the first problem to the instance of the second problem in such a way that you satisfy um, the condition that the answers are preserved. And we will see a lot of these reductions as we go through the class. And we will see that reduction-based thinking can not only be very powerful, but that you have to be quite creative to do it. You have to be clever about the reductions you come up with. And they can be really quite surprising. Your ability to take a problem of one form and make it look like something completely different um, will develop. And I think this reduction ability is another, uh, as I said, the second highlight that you can take away from the class. Here's another one. Historically, people had the view that solving a problem meant always getting the right answer. One of the interesting developments of the late 20th century was people asking, well, what if I'm willing to compromise just a little? I will be willing to accept wrong answers with a tiny, tiny probability. So algorithms will now be randomized. How does that help us? And the interesting answer is that while it doesn't change solvability in principle, it doesn't change whether we can do something or not, it changes speed, so we can solve problems a lot faster in this regime. Understanding how to work with randomized algorithms and use randomness to speed up computation, and the mere fact that randomness plays a role in computation is also, I think, kind of both philosophically and algorithmically interesting. And here's a final highlight. We said earlier that I want to consider different types of notions of solvability, not just the most basic that you get an input, you have to trundle along and give the right answer in some finite amount of time. Well, we already saw one variation. Maybe I won't always give the right answer, but I'll do so with high probability. Here's another way to look at the world. The problem that you want to solve, which is represented by some input little x, and uh, you want to know whether little x belongs to some set P, has been provided to you by some alien who has arrived from outer space and has a, is a very part of a very advanced civilization which can solve all kinds of hard problems that we don't know how to solve. And they come and tell you, here's this little x, and I claim that it's an instance of P. It belongs there. And us as our poor, weak earthlings, we look at the alien in confusion and say, yeah, that's what you claim, but why would I believe you? Now, maybe the alien says, why don't you just check it, run a program on X or something, but we don't have those kinds of programs. We can't do that quickly. So the alien says, okay, I'm going to help, and I'm going to provide you more information. And this information is a proof. And by using that proof, the verifier will be convinced of the original claim. This process of providing a proof could be just a single message, here's a proof, it, but it could be a conversation, a back and flow interaction. It could even use randomness. And its purpose is that at the end of this, the verifier, even though not very smart and not very computationally powerful, 
is convinced that the prover's claim is true. So this is another way to look at problems and quite an interesting one, not just philosophically, but one that's had a powerful influence and impact in complexity theory and computer science at large. Um, the last highlight is even more um, high level, let's say, or abstract. It's valuable in my view to learn precision in language and thinking that comes through the use of mathematics. Mathematical language will be the main language for what we do in the class. And when you learn to communicate through that language, it not only sharpens the way you communicate, but it sharpens how you understand things. And this can be valuable across a lot of things. So I hope those kinds of things um, give you some sort of incentive to, to think further about taking this class and studying these topics. Until next time, see you later.